Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So thanks so much to everyone for uh, coming. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to have Stephanie here. Um, she, I've had the pleasure of getting to know her this year. She's a colleague of my wife's at the Harvard Society of Fellows. And uh, she's, in my opinion, the most interesting of her colleagues at the Harvard Society of Fellows. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 of my wife's colleagues okay. at the Harvard Society of Colleagues. She's the most interesting of her colleagues at the Harvard Society of Fellows. Um, and uh, uh, I think she's like the perfect talk to tie together this lab because she's talking about the history of uh, mathematics and computation in places like Microsoft uh, Research, uh, sort of, uh, in the uh, middle of the 20th century. And uh, we're really excited to hear about it. Thanks. Hey, thanks a lot, Ben. I'm really excited to have a chance to be here, to have a, an opportunity to share some of my work with this very vibrant and eclectic community. Um, I've also had a really wonderful day. You guys are really generous hosts, and it was a, a pleasure to have a chance to talk with some of you. And I'm local, so I, I would love to have a chance to talk with more of you in the future, um, if that turns out to be possible. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today and what my history is interested in general are mathematical proofs, which I imagine everyone in this room is in some way, shape, or form familiar. Uh, proofs, of course, are supposed to demonstrate that something in mathematics is true, uh, that an object has some property or that it behaves in a certain way or that it has a particular kind of relationship to something else. Uh, and one of the sort of canonical features of proof is that they are supposed to demonstrate that that thing is true uh, not just for one example or another example, but always and everywhere for this class of things. So a very simple example, um, the internal angles of a triangle. You can prove that this will be 180 degrees, not for this triangle or that one or all the triangles we've seen, uh, but for all possible triangles everywhere, at least everywhere in Euclidean geometry. Uh, and this is the sort of canonical way of thinking and talking about what proofs are and what kinds of claims are made in them. Uh, but it turns out that Different things, of course, count as a proof for different communities working in different times and places. Different standards of demonstration serve to convince some communities that something is the case and not others. So there have been long parts of mathematics history where diagrams were perfectly admissible tools in the construction of proof. And there have been other times and places where there was deep skepticism and distrust of diagrams. Uh, different communities disagree about what axioms to use, about what rules of inference should be permitted. And so in spite of this sort of central claim to time and placelessness that proofs have, uh, there's a lot of work to be done unpacking what in fact counts as a proof for who. Um, and much recent history of mathematics has been aimed at unpacking different communities and cultures of proving to find out what counts as a proof for them and how they go about producing them. Uh, but in spite of the many variations among different communities of provers, uh, for much of mathematics history, they have something quite fundamental in common, which is that proofs are something that people make. Uh, but what I'm interested in is this moment in the mid-1950s where different communities of practitioners uh, in the United States and elsewhere ask the question whether or not computers might become theorem provers as well. Uh, as you might expect, Computers created some very new and powerful and exciting possibilities for the work of mathematical proof, uh, but they've also been quite controversial. Uh, some computer proofs with which I assume many of you are familiar, including the computer-assisted proof of the four-color conjecture from 1976, are so long uh, that no person could actually read them all the way through. Uh, others of them make use of computational operations that are quite combinatorially complex and not easily apprehended as correct or understood or easily followed uh, by a human reader. So there has been some discussion among mathematicians and philosophers of mathematics about whether or not these kinds of computer demonstrations should count as proofs in the first place. Uh, some people are willing to admit that computers might show us 
uh, that something is true, but that they may not be able to show why something is true, because they don't identify the same kinds of central insights or extrapolatable ideas or important moments that human mathematicians uh, are interested in. So these kinds of questions have been on the minds of some mathematicians and some philosophers of math, maybe some in this room, uh, since probably the 1970s and somewhat earlier. Uh, these are not my questions. <laughs> Uh, this is not the question that motivates my work, uh, although, of course, it's related. The question that has motivated my first project is a prior question to this one. Uh, what I wanted to know was how these so-called computer proofs were made and made possible in the first place. I wanted to know what actually went into the design and implementation of theorem-proving software in these communities in the second half of the 20th century, about which people would later have these debates about what counts as a proof and what does not. So I wanted to look at the sort of earlier development work that precedes those debates as a way of sort of changing and shaping and intervening in them from a historical perspective. Uh, so to that end, my, my first project is an early history of a field called automated theorem proving, <laughs> not surprisingly. Uh, it's sometimes also called automated reasoning and automated deduction, those two names more commonly in the recent decades. And practitioners of this field, of course, were interested in uh, making computers proof theorems or assisting human users in doing so. Uh, but to me, it's a very interesting field because the people working within it really disagreed about what the automation of proof should look like. Uh, some people thought that computers might become totally autonomous and sophisticated contributors to mathematical research. Other people thought they'd never be more than servants or slaves to take on the very menial tasks of mathematical work. Here are some snippets just from some of the people I've studied very closely using often very uh, provocative anthropomorphic language to describe what role they believe computers might be able to play in the future of mathematics. So colleagues and mentors at one end, servants and slaves at the other end, and something like the lowly graduate student in the middle who can make contributions but only with excessive guidance and with limited importance. Um, and what interests me, of course, was unpacking these different visions and finding out where they came from, but my real question was, how did these visions get built right into the theorem-proving software that these practitioners developed? How did they translate their vision of what kinds of things computers were into programs that contributed to the work of proof in different ways uh, on the ground? Uh, and in particular, to date, I have focused primarily on these three, uh, and I'll say a little bit about why in a moment, but. Uh, the logic theory machine that was developed at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, California between 1955 and 57. Uh, the program P that was developed first at IBM Research Labs and later at Bell Research Labs in the late 1950s. And finally, the automated reasoning assistant, uh, or the Aura, that was developed at the Argonne National Laboratory just outside of Chicago, with some pieces from the mid-1960s and some pieces that were being developed into the 80s. Um, I chose these three programs because, as we'll see, they represented exemplars of very different approaches to the project of automation. Uh, the people who built them envisioned quite a different role for the computer in the work of proof. I also picked them because these programs and the people and the institutions uh, where they were developed had different relationships to the landscape of military industrial academic collaboration in the post-war period. Uh, but primarily, I picked them because the people who developed them quite fundamentally disagreed about just about everything. They disagreed about the character of human mathematical faculties, like intuition, like understanding, like reasoning, uh, and they disagreed about how much a computer might be made to possess those things, and they disagreed about what computer-generated or computer-assisted proofs uh, could or should look like. So the logic theory machine was developed by primarily by Alan Newell and Herbert Simon, with whom I imagine most of you are familiar. Uh, and they, of course, subscribed to a belief that in a really fundamental way, the human mind and the computer were of a kind. Uh, and they sought to simulate human mathematical and theorem-proving practices in their computer program. Um, the program P was developed by an, a Chinese-American logician by the name of Hao Wang, who fundamentally disagreed either that humans and machines uh, were like the same kind of thing, or that the right way to use a computer would be to simulate what we can already do. He was instead interested in what new possibilities the computer might create because of being quite different from a human mathematician. 
uh, and the automated reasoning assistant. So was, why do you say sure. that? Uh, uh, that's surpassing. It's uh, <laughs> supplementing, but yeah. right, not necessarily surpassing. That's right? right. That's right. I should specify that surpass was a word he often used. As I, I think, and I think as a kind of PR term, he was under no illusion that human insight and intervention and design could be extricated from this process. But he was particularly interested in the sort of speed and power of combinatorial manipulation that, that we can't keep up with mm -hmm. in that particular regard. Um, the team that worked at the Argonne National Laboratory under the direction of, of a, a character, Larry Wass, uh, just simply didn't believe that in either of these cases computers would become autonomous contributors to, to theorem proving, and they thought instead their real power would be in developing collaborative software that could assist and guide a human user in different and new ways towards the work of proof. Um, so these were the three programs that I focused on the most. Moving forward with this project, I'll probably study uh, others. I know some about others, and I'm happy to speak to the sort of other variations on these themes in the field if people are interested. Uh, and what I'm going to do with the rest of my time today is tell you quite a lot about the logic theory machine, a very tiny bit about the program P, and a little bit more about the automated reasoning assistant, just to give you a sense of the, the way the programs were designed and the kind of work in them that interests me and that I think matter for the history of how proof is being done. Um, I often say things like, there is no automation without invention. And I think that each of these exercises involve the production of new formal tools and also new material tools and new practices and perspectives uh, that were added to the corpus of what it means to do the work of proof. Uh, and so I'll try to give you a sense of what some of those transformations and inventions uh, that I think are interesting look like. Yes, of course, I'll talk about that. So the first two were both specifically designed theorem provers for the theorems from Principia Mathematica, a text which I'll talk about in just a moment. And, and the aura had slightly different, had a slightly different problem base, but I'll, I will talk about those things. Um, so as I said, the logic theory machine was developed at the Rand Corporation which was, of course, founded just on the heels of the Second World War by the Air Force. It's famous for being a hotbed of systems engineering and game theory. Um, but I don't think that's actually where the story of the logic theory machine starts. I uh, think that story starts more around the turn of the 20th century with these two English mathematicians, Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead. And of course, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, Russell and Whitehead were working with a community of mathematicians at the turn of the century to develop what we now think of as sort of modern propositional and predicate logic. And they believed quite famously, and also quite famously wrongly, <laughs> that every theorem from every branch of mathematics could ultimately be proved within the formal logical system that they were developing at this time. Uh, and they spent about a decade drafting what became their three canonical works, these volumes of Principia Mathematica, in which they lay out this logical system and then proceed to prove hundreds of theorems within it uh, very tediously, getting to the incredible results that, in fact, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 on page 298. <laughs> um, and this, this is, of course, well-documented part of the history of mathematics. Uh, but there is something about Principia that is much less remarked upon by my colleagues in the history of mathematics uh, and the history of logic. And that is that they weren't just interested in crafting a formalism. Uh, Whitehead and Russell will, uh, were also interested in crafting a set of material tools that they thought would enable the heads and hands of mathematicians to do the work of mathematics and proof in this way. Um, and that, of course, was a very particular symbolic notation system, a way of writing and reading on the page. Uh, and they said this about it. Uh, the symbolic form of the work has been forced upon us by necessity. Without its help, we should have been unable to perform the requisite reasoning. It has been developed as the result of actual practice and is not an excrescence introduced for the mere purpose of exposition. No symbol has been introduced except on the ground of its practical utility for the immediate purposes of our reasoning. They actually spend an extraordinary amount of time justifying and describing the value of the symbol system that they worked out. Um, of course, at bottom, the symbol system was meant to make highly abstract things like logical relation and inference easy to see. They wanted to make patterns visible, they wanted to make structural comparison easy, and they wanted to make proofs easy to follow and to construct and to read line by line on the page. 
Theirs was built on a previous one developed by Peano. And of course, this kind of written symbol system is extremely familiar to us. This is how we do mathematics and logic for the most part. Uh, but it's worth remarking that there is a particular spatiality to it. There is a particular materiality to it. These are paper proofs in book form. Um, and logical expressions are here represented in a way that accommodates vision. It's the primary faculty for doing mathematical work. We're supposed to be able to take these things in as a whole and cognize them in ways that wouldn't be possible in natural language or other systems. So, the question that interested me was what happened to the way proofs were being constructed, what happened to the way that logical propositions and relationships were being represented in this transformation from text to the Rand Joniak computer <laughs> beginning in, the in 1955. I wanted to know how it was that logic was being done and with what tools and processes uh, in this transformation. Um, so I'll tell you that story now, uh, and I can't do that without explaining a little bit about these two men, uh, of course, Newell and Simon. Newell left a PhD program in mathematics at Princeton in 1950 to take up a position at RAND. Yes? Sorry, before you leave Russell and Whitehead, yeah. it sounded like a minute ago you were showing us that page from, from Principia and claiming that this does correspond to what comprehensible mathematics looks like to <laughs> yes. real people. Yes. Whereas the main thing that jumps off your slide at me yes. is that math papers <laughs> never look this way. And the, the, the notion that an entire population of you know, eventually every practicing mathematician would come to write their work up in this notation, yes. that, like in the hindsight of 100 years later, seems like folly. And I, <laughs> How was it yes. perceived at the time? <laughs> That's a great question. And actually, so having studied logic in college and graduate school, I went to Principia expecting to open it and find you know, what I had been studying in logic class. And of course, it looks totally incomprehensible. Um, at, the, at the time, it was so closely related to first Peano and then Frege's systems that it would have been familiar to this particular community of mathematicians. The one that we are now more familiar was Hilbert and Ackerman's symbol system, which they designed because they thought this one was terrible. And I'm not exactly sure why they thought this was terrible. But I really like this point, because all through the pages of Principia, Russell and Whitehead are constantly calling on the obvious, intuitive, natural primitiveness of everything, including what is an obvious inference rule, what is an obvious conclusion. This is obviously a totally tractable symbol system for people to work within. And in reading it now, I think this isn't obvious, <laughs> this isn't natural, this doesn't strike me as primitive at all. Um, and that, I think, does speak to the particularly contingent character of, of these kinds of tools and representation systems that are tied to communities of people. Um, I guess what I want to emphasize is that here they have in mind a sort of seeing, reading, familiar with algebra kind of mathematical agent. Um, and, and this will have more in common with what people use than the symbol system, or than not symbol systems, than the representational system designed to enable the Johnny Act to do this work. So there are sort of bigger and smaller differences, I guess. But that's a great point. Thank you. Is that? Is that... I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so these two, <laughs> uh, uh, Newell left his PhD program at Princeton in 1950. Um, he was deeply dissatisfied with mathematics. He said he could not imagine how people could spend their lives doing that kind of work. Those problems were not his problems. He wanted to do practical, exciting, hands-on work that wasn't quite so abstract and esoteric. He was very honest and vocal about that. Simon, of course, was a professor at Carnegie Technical Institute in business administration and economics, and he started consulting for the Rand Corporation in 1952. Uh, and for those who are somewhat unfamiliar, when the Air Force created the Rand Corporation and allotted it significant resources, the sort of general mandate they were given was to imagine and model what future possible global warfare might look like and to design strategies for winning or optimizing performance. Oh. <laughs> this is a very tall, amazing order, uh, especially given the uncertainty surrounding what new technologies might be developed or who the global aggressor might be or what have you. So they developed a lot of really amazing tools for imagining the landscape of war and, and sort of approaching a study 
one of which, uh, one of the largest of which is sort of unified under the rubric of what's called systems analysis. Uh, so in this approach to research, they would parse the landscape of warfare into systems, which could be anything from uh, the Bolshevik government to an individual you know, weapon system on an airplane to, um, to the railway system, and they would try to find ways of modeling and empirically studying and ultimately optimizing the performance of different kinds of systems that could consist of people or machines or just machines. It was a really beautiful you know, way of approaching a very large and sprawling problem. Uh, and crucially for our story, Newell and Simon came to believe that the right way to study human minds and human reasoning and also modern digital computers were as systems as well. Uh, they're quite t famous for saying that the mind and the administrative organization and the computer are species of the same genus, and that genus was uh, information processor. They took symbolic information as input and they manipulated it according to a set of rules, and that was how they would solve problems, make decisions, um, uh, formulate judgments. And the logic theory machine, uh, this theorem proving program for Principia Mathematica from the turn of the 20th century, was in fact their first attempt to build a computer program that they thought captured something about rule bound human reasoning behavior. So it was a complex information processing system, and they set about to try to identify what it is that human mathematicians do when they prove logical theorems to reduce that to a set of rules and translate it into this computer program. Um, for those who may not know, the logic theory machine was actually the only running program that was presented at the 1956 Dartmouth conference around which the phrase artificial intelligence was coined. Uh, it was very instrumental for the character of early AI research. Um, and it began as this exercise in finding a, a rule bound similarity between humans and machines. Uh, so to actualize this project, the first thing they needed was a model of what exactly it is that people do when they prove theorems. And for that, Newell and Simon turned to this man, the Hungarian mathematician George Polya. So in addition to his uh, mathematical research, he was also deeply interested in the problem of mathematics pedagogy. Uh, Alan Newell took every course he taught while an undergrad at Stanford, which is where that influence came from. Uh, and Polya believed, contrary to some idealizations or mythologizations of mathematics that what mathematicians do is not just deduce consequences from axioms the way they're sometimes presented in logical texts like Principia. <laughs> he thinks they do all kinds of things. They start from something they believe to be true and work backwards, they experiment with cases, uh, they look for counterexamples, they do all kinds of things besides deduction. And Polya thought Moreover, that these sort of tricks or shortcuts or, or actual mathematical practices were not esoteric, tacit secrets of the trade. He thought they could be identified, articulated, formalized as rules, and most importantly, taught to undergraduates to give them some hope of becoming contributing mathematical researchers. Um, he wrote this, which I love, certainly let us learn proving uh, but also, let us learn guessing. So let us learn more than the deduction of consequences. Let us learn to guess. So he, of course, called these ways of guessing heuristics from the Greek word for to find. Uh, and is, as far as I can tell, the person who sort of reintroduced that word to our sort of modern way of talking about mathematics, um, which is interesting. So this was exactly what Newell and Simon wanted, right? This was a set of rules that were supposed to model and capture human theorem proving behavior. Uh, and so the logic theory machine was a first attempt to automate polia-like heuristics in theorem proving. Uh, there were two heuristics in particular. They weren't overly ambitious. Uh, the first one is that the logic theory machine did not begin with the axioms of Principia and move forward deducing consequences in search of theorems. This, of course, leads to an exponential explosion of data and is practically impossible now still and certainly in the 50s. Uh, so instead, the logic theorem machine begins with a theorem from Principia that it wants to prove, and then it generates <clears throat> a set of subproblems that, if true, lead to the desired conclusion in a single permissible inference step. This is like inferential reverse engineering. Uh, and then it produces a set of subproblems that lead to those subproblems in a single step, and so on, uh, in hopes, of course, that the axioms will be generated themselves as subproblems, in which case you can run the path backwards 
and have a deductive proof of your desired theorem. Um, of course, there's no guarantee that you will find a proof of the theorem this way, but this did not trouble Newell and Simon, who uh, suggested that, in fact, human mathematicians never work with that kind of guarantee either. <laughs> um, so this was the model, and in most of the literature that addresses the logic theory machine at all, in academic historian of computing, this is the end of the story. This was the first heuristic theorem prover, this was the model, this is what the logic theory machine is. Um, it was famous because of early artificial intelligence research, and that's all true. But I wanted to know how they actually got this model to run on the Joniac computer. Uh, and this turned out to be an extraordinarily difficult task. Um, they had to take logical propositions and inference rules and subproblem chaining and somehow put them into uh, the machinery of the Joniac, which it turns out neither Newell nor Simon really knew very much about. Uh, in order to actually implement this model, they had to enlist a third, much less famous collaborator by the name of John Clifford Shaw. Uh, he worked in the numerical analysis department at RAND, which was later renamed the programming department. He came from an engineering and mathematics undergraduate background and took that position um, <clears throat> after fighting in the Air Force in the Second World War. Um, he, I love this. He actually describes the numerical analysis department at RAND as the sweatshop of the company. Uh, the, the machines themselves were housed in the basement. Um, at that time, programming, maybe quite unlike today, was a really physical enterprise. They had to carry heavy boxes of punch cards from one machine to the next. The machines produced a lot of heat and noise, and they would often work without their shirts. It's this whole other world in which the models and the simulations for other departments and divisions at RAND were actually made to run on, on machines, and it, it's quite something to learn about them. So it was primarily with Shaw's help working with Newell and less with Simon um, that the Logic Theory machine was translated into a running program. Uh, and there were a lot of obstacles to overcome, but the one that seemed to have held their attention the longest and been the trickiest for them is how to represent logical propositions. Um, and the archives are amazing. Uh, Shaw and Newell's archive collections show them experimenting on paper with different kinds of structures to see what it would be like to represent a logical proposition this way in memory. Uh, and ultimately, after about a year of that kind of experimentation, they choose the linked list uh, information structure as the representational system for logical propositions. We, of course, now call this a data structure. Um, but they used information for a lot of really complicated reasons I can talk about. <laughs> data structures are, of course, I'm sure everyone here is familiar, uh, just what they sound like. They're ways of organizing information in computer memory, such as to make them sort of controllable, meaningful encodings of the various things we would like to put into computer memory. And in a linked list representation, each element of a logical proposition was represented by an alphabet of symbols that encoded different parts of the of information about it, like uh, what kind of element it was. Was it a variable or an operator? Was it negated? What position did it hold in the proposition? And of course, the last bit of memory in, in this contiguous chunk labeled Q up there stored the numerical address and memory of the next element in the proposition which of course could be stored anywhere else in Johnny X memory, that there happened to be memory available. Um, so here, of course, this is maybe obvious. <laughs> the elements of the logical proposition are, by design, not stored together, not concatenated and held as a single object that could be taken in by the eye, or even taken in by the computer all at once as a single whole. Uh, in this structure, the only way to treat a logical proposition as a whole is to traverse the address pointers. Logical propositions become dynamic and temporal in a way that's slightly different. They have different behaviors and properties than when they're written on the page. Um, and of course, they chose this representation system to address a very particular problem of memory management that matters now, but it also mattered in 1955 and it especially mattered for machines like the Joniac that had, I think, about 52 kilobytes for the equivalent thereof of memory. So just to, to emphasize what they were excited about, um, imagine if you have like a guest list for a party and you want to keep track of the people that can't come. It's much more efficient to just cross a name off of the list than it is to rewrite the entire list all together on a new sheet of paper or find a new sheet of paper if you're out of paper. Uh, and that's the kind of trick that the linked list represents. If you want to, for example, delete an element from a logical proposition in the process of producing these subproblem chains, 
rather than rewriting the entire expression together, finding the memory, or creating the memory, you would simply reroute the address pointer from the previous element to the following element and add a new address pointer from a list of existing available current memory to the thing you just deleted. So that made two operations out of what would have been a large number of housekeeping operations. And it was this kind of trick in 1955 that made the difference between a program that would run on the computer and a program that remained just a model. Uh, and yet this kind of insight, this kind of idea, this kind of tool construction is um, really underemphasized and understudied uh, by people like me who are interested in the relevance of, of the introduction of computing to, to different kinds of work. Um, I also think that linked lists offer a different set of insights and, and show traces of a different kind of perspective about what logical propositions are. It's a different way of constructing them, and although it's at this low level of representation, it also does introduce new properties and behaviors to them. It represents a different perspective about what they are. It also, given how prolific linked lists have become today, um, offered some ready-made structural analogies with other things that people use linked lists to represent, and a lack of that, where linked lists are not a good tool, just sort of offers a new set of tools for thinking about what logical propositions are um, that I think is very interesting. Yes? So logical propositions have a kind of nested structure defined by yes. brackets. Yes. So. What status did open bracket and close bracket have in the Yeah, this is a great question. And when I talk about the logic theory machine, I just don't talk about it at all. So after they have their heuristic model of how to do this backwards chaining uh, by subproblem construction, the next step in the development of the logic theory machine was actually to develop a new set of tools for thinking about both proofs as trees and also logical propositions as trees. So in fact, uh, if, you, if you use a tree to represent a logical proposition, you don't need parentheses at all because the, uh, you know, the, the yep. order of logical operations is just built into the tree structure. So the linked list operations, or the linked list structure was actually a representation of a tree structure, which they worked out in some length in between. Um, and those, that piece of information about what level in the tree any given operator or variable held were encoded in the sort of eight letter variables that they used in the linked list. <laughs> <laughs> but this is also this is also a sort of housekeeping problem because trees are more efficient as a representation because you don't need to parse the parentheses, which we do quite easily with sight, but which add a lot of computational operations for the machine. Um, so, so they yes. This might be a very pedestrian question, but I doubt it. it seems <laughs> like you're sort of one level below implying that a lot of sort of modern data structures sort of could have arisen or certainly were invented to some extent in the process of trying to make sense of Principia Mathematica and embody it in the particular physical structures that were relevant at that time. Do you think that that's a good representation or are you just not, you're, you're letting that be just below the surface because you're not completely sure that that's the case? Okay, so I'm not completely sure that that's the case. So, so some things are certain. Yeah. One thing is certain is that when I learned about linked lists, which was way before I ever learned about the logic theory yeah. machine, they just seemed like the most obvious, totally intuitive thing to me. Yeah. Um, and that somebody would have had to come up with it <laughs> um, seemed very bizarre to me. Yeah. And when I discovered that not only did they have to come up with it, but that they tried a whole bunch of other things first, did leave me with the impression that the linked list is tied to this automation effort. That it has been totally stripped of its origins and found useful and relevant in uncountable instances. It can be implemented in almost every language, I think. It, you know, that they have prolif you know, proliferated independently of this origin context, I think doesn't make this origin context uninteresting. Um, but what I would really like to do, maybe sometime in the future, is, is do a history of data structures. And, and see where the different ones come from if they were developed relative to a certain particular problem. Um, it seems like the, the knowledge about that question is mostly anecdotal where it exists at all. And, and I do think that it's not necessarily the case that linked lists in the form they have would have developed exactly the same in other contexts. I think there is something 
particular about this moment, but it's really hard to make claims like that. <laughs> well, the other the place they came from was Lisp, right, which also came out of logic. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, not only did they create this like, list data structure, they developed this language, the information processing language, or IPL, they called it, which is, uh, but by many of Lisp developers' own admission, the predecessor. They were sort of adopting Lisp processing tools from the IPL in their development of Lisp. Um, that's something else I didn't mention, is that all of the inference rules and those heuristics for working backwards were translated into something like 44 variations of eight list processing operations, which are sort of quite different processes for theorem proving than the ones that we execute on the page, I guess. But, um, but I think Lisp was sort of following off on these, on these developments in a very real, tangible way. Uh, but you probably know more about that than I do. <laughs> very hazy about the early origins of Lisp. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was before my time. <laughs> um, it's so funny. You go and you, you, know, you read notebooks in the archive because I wasn't there. You know? um, so you try to reconstruct these stories based on archival materials. And it only takes one person who is there to say, I really don't think that that's what happened to make you doubt your whole, you know, archival experience. <laughs> but, um, so just to summarize the kind of thing I think is very interesting about the logic theory machine as an example of doing this kind of historical work, um, every element of what proof is here gets reimagined and retooled in some way. So they ask this question, what is human reasoning? They read Polia and they see his heuristics. Polya's heuristics are actually really quite sophisticated, um, and from that they take, you know, working backwards by subproblem chaining and hold it up as a good model of what human theorem proving behavior is. And I think that's really remarkable. Uh, and of course, a lot of early AI in the 50s and 60s sought to do the same in other disciplines. What are the heuristics of medical diagnosis? What are the heuristics of, um, <laughs> of, of, of psychological um, questioning? They're, they're sort of this move to, to identify these heuristics uh, following along this platform. And, and that's obviously not just a simple representation. They're, they're sort of making a claim about what human faculties are that's new. Um, and then this transformation from, from a representational system that accommodates people and vision and reading and paper to a representation uh, that accommodates the Joniac is, I think, significant. There's, a lot of recent work in the history of mathematics about the roles that uh, the letter diagram played in, in the emergence of deductive reasoning in the classical period. Uh, people are also interested in algebraic symbol systems or the difference between Leibnizian and Newtonian calculus representational systems. Um, I would like to pose the question to the people who write about those things. Uh, what do we learn and know differently when we develop these computationally oriented representation systems? Um, and, and I think that the, the answer to that question has to do with this sort of dynamism and temporality and sort of algorithmic quality that gets introduced to mathematical objects in those kinds of transformations. Um, OK, <laughs> so now I'm only going to say a very little bit about this wonderful character, uh, Hao Wang, who developed the program P. I'm happy to say a lot more about him if anybody is interested. He was one of the most vocal critics of the logic theory machine, quite uh, ungenerously and publicly. <laughs> um, and at bottom, he thinks they made two errors. The first one was Sorry. that they ma Yes? Before you switch topics, yeah. um, kind of ignorant about how successful that agenda was. With oh, <laughs> right. I and always so forget. I always forget to talk about this. So ultimately, the logic theory machine proved 38 of the first 52 sort of canonical theorems in, in the first volume of Principia. Um, one of those proofs was, all, all of those proofs but one, uh, looked very much like the ones that Russell and Whitehead published in Principia, which Newell and Simon took to be great evidence of the fact that there was a deep similarity between the processes at stake in both of them. Uh, one of those proofs was a previously, a supposedly previously unknown one. Um, and Bertrand Russell was still alive at this time, and he and Simon have this delightful sort of six-letter correspondence in which he sends him the proof. Did you know this proof and didn't include it for some reason? And Russell said, no, um, that's more elegant than the proof that we have produced. Newell and Simon also really celebrated this. Russell also said, what a great tragedy that we wasted 10 years <laughs> of our lives um, working out all the proofs for these theorems that are now, you know, going to be proved by computers in probably a very short time. 
Um, so it was considered a great success. Of course, Newell and Simon are, are, are brilliant and very aware of the limitations of this. They thought this is just a very small step towards a comprehensive model of human practice. It's also a tiny step relative to results, but they thought this was really the right path um, to move forward with artificial intelligence research. And a lot of people working in the field in the early decades sort of followed after their, their method. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> they gave it up after this, right? And went and did other things. Yeah, they did. They definitely gave up fear improving. So the next, the next engine they built that was supposed to simulate human behavior was a chess machine. Um, and then after that, they started work on the GPS, the, the general problem solver, which was their most ambitious project, supposed to uh, enable the computer to heuristically solve problems in all kinds of domains, which was never really very successful. But they, they were always so optimistic that this was the right way. <laughs> so. Um, but this was their only, their only engagement with, with automated theorem proving. Um, um, all right, so Wang, right, Wang thought they got two things really wrong. He thought one of the things they really got wrong uh, was the idea that somehow mathematical research is rule bound in some way, that all of the human mathematical faculties of intuition and exploration are rule bound phenomena. Um, he wrote, Logicians had worked with the fiction of man as a persistent and unimaginative beast who can only follow rules, and then the fiction found its incarnation <laughs> in the machine. Oh and, and he accused Newell and Simon of, of um, wrongly accepting the fiction and then wrongly recognizing the computer as a representation of man when all this time it had been a representation of nothing other than a fiction. And the other thing that Wang thought they got wrong was that even if they were right, even if it was the case that machines would be able to do the things that people do, this was the wrong way to use them anyway, because we can already do all those things, and it would be more advantageous to orient computer research towards what people can't do. So he wrote uh, that the human inability to command precisely any great mass of details sets an intrinsic limitation on the kind of thing that is done in mathematics and the manner in which it is done. The superiority of machines in this respect indicates that machines, while following the broad outline of paths drawn up by man, might yield surprising results uh, by making many new turns which man is not accustomed to taking. We are, in fact, faced with a challenge to devise methods of buying originality with plodding uh, now that we are in possession of slaves which are such persistent plodders. Um, Wong went on to develop a program called the Program P, um, where the logic theorem machine proved 32 theorems in something like 10 minutes of computing time. The program P proved every theorem in all of Principia in under three minutes. It's a really powerful engine for its time. Uh, and it is based on a completely different set of insights and ideas and approaches to automation uh, than the logic theorem machine. In particular, how Wang wanted to use the computer to take some of the abstract results of mathematical logic and of proof theory and make them into actionable tools for doing work in mathematics, to change their role and status. So I'll say just a very little bit about this, but the program P was based on Herbrand's theorem, uh, which is one of the fundamental results of proof theory. Uh, and it states that given any statement P in the predicate calculus, you can construct an infinite series of statements, S1, S2, and so on, in the propositional calculus, which is a simpler branch of logic. And the theorem gives us that P is a theorem if and only if, for some number n, the first n statements in that series, connected by the OR operator in a disjunctive series, creates a tautology. So either S1 or S1 or S2 or S1 or S2 or S3 and so on is a tautology, meaning it's true under the assignment of anything to its variables. Um, this theorem was really important for proof theory, but what it was was a reflection on the relationship between these two branches of logic. It's a really surprising result because the propositional calculus is decidable and the predicate calculus is not. <laughs> But of course, you can't get something for nothing. So this infinite series uh, might be an infinite series. And there are some cases where you can calculate an upper bound for n. But in lots of cases, there's no way to know if you'll ever find a tautology or if a tautology is impossible. So this was a certain kind of theorem. It was a reflection about the relationship of two branches of logic, not a toolkit for actually proving statements in the predicate calculus. But Wang saw in the computer an opportunity to build on Herbrand's theorem 
to make a set of tools for actually proving theorems in the predicate calculus. Uh, and it is, turned out to be more efficient, much and it's, more efficient. And it's very yeah. powerful. It actually yeah. turns out that, um, well, there's a lot to say about this, but um, yes, this, this program, uh, using these insights from Herbrand's theorem, successfully proved all of the theorems from Principia and was generally in this community thought to be a more interesting and more important mm -hmm. program, even though it made no claim to reflect what it is that people do. So the insight behind the program is that while you can't have a computer check an infinite series for you know, disjunctive tautologies and the prefixes either, um, her, uh, Wong wondered whether or not there was some structure in Herbrand's theorem that you could exploit to turn this infinite problem into a finite problem and check whether or not the construction of a tautology would be impossible. Um, and, and so, so am I right to think that this is like the conceptual origins of what ended up being the most successful actual new theorems that were approved in the sense that it was a bunch of case checking and that's sort of what most of the actually new theorems that have been proved through automated theorem proving work? Yes. <laughs> so the answer is yes, but not this one. Okay. Um, the, the thing that has been the most powerful is the resolution principle, which if I have time I'll say a very little bit about. Um, but Wang's idea that this was the right way to put computers to work, doing a large number of case checking. Um, I love his archives are full of these empty tables because even after you turn this into a finite problem, even for very simple cases, you can, you can have to check three trillion possible patterns for, for, for forcing a tautology. So, so the, just to say very quickly, the very basic idea is that even though these series are infinite, um, you can reduce to a finite set of possible structures that might make a proposition false. So this example is an implication function, and the only ways that an implication function can be false is if the left hand is true and the right hand is false. So even though these g's, which are just uh, predicate functions which take two variables and gives you back true or false, depending on whether or not those two variables have some relationship, like that they're both odd or that one is the square of the other or whatever, um, the predicate calculus is set up so that you don't need to know what the g's are in order to ask this kind of question. Um, so even though there are an infinite number of substitutions for x, y, and z in this example, overall it can only be false if the left hand is true and the right hand is false because of the definition of the implication function. So the, first, the computer's first task is to build a truth table of ways in which um, a proposition could be made to fail to be true and then to go through and check if forcing one to fail to be true forces another one to be true because of the variable assignments that you've input. And if you can show that every possible pattern for making the expression false forces another one to be true, then you can show there will always be a disjunctive tautology. Um, so that's the basic idea of this proof. Which is um, a lot less efficient than resolution. Yes, which is a lot <laughs> less efficient than resolution. Yeah. It was still okay. far more powerful than the logic theory right. machine. Um, and and this, this Wong thought was sort of the right way, the right way to do automated proof. Um, he's a very interesting character. He had a lot of complicated relationships with Marxism. He was under surveillance by the FBI for much of his career. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot to say about him and his work. Um, he actually won the first milestone award from the American Mathematical Society in automated theorem proving for this, uh, for this program. But I have very little time, so I'll say a little bit about the aura now to, to finish, which of course, as I said before, they thought both of these approaches would fundamentally and, and, and irrefutably be, be, res be um, restricted in their possibilities because computers just wouldn't be able to be autonomous contributors to mathematical knowledge. They don't know what mathematicians care about. They can only identify things that are interesting, that we tell them are interesting. Uh, mathematics is not just about the, the churning out of truth. It's about the identification of sort of interesting and, and productive insights. And, and uh, the people working at Argonne thought the only way to include computers in that process was to make them collaborative uh, with human users. Um, this project was undertaken in the Applied Mathematics Division, which was a lot like the Numerical Analysis Department at RAND. They got quite a lot of freedom and decided it would be really important as a general project to study the limitations of automation uh, rather than just use the computer as a handmaiden or a tool or a service instrument to other divisions at the lab. Um, and the person who headed up uh, until very recently their automated theorem proving department was Larry Wass. Um, 
He's also a very interesting character. He was born completely blind and developed a complex braille system, system excuse me, throughout his life to, to do his higher mathematics. Um, and, and it was his experience as a mathematician uh, of, of moving forward with mathematical research based on intuitive leaps in the shower or, or intuitive instincts or ideas while on a walk. He, just, he was drawing from a lot of folklore about what mathematical discovery is like, I think. But he was very committed that computers could never be made to do these things on their own. Um, he wrote that proving theorems in mathematics and logic is too complex a task for total automation, for it requires insight, deep thought, and much knowledge and experience. And so the, the approach to research at Argonne was to develop a collaborative theorem prover, as I said, that would be structured like this. The human user would be able to impart her intuitions or insights about a mathematical problem, and the theorem prover would then run with those insights using these sort of powerful combinatorial tools like the one that Wong developed further and faster and to different places than that human collaborator might be able to go on their own. So there were sort of two parts to this. They took the work of proof and partitioned it into two kinds of work. There's the intuitive work and the inference work. And that in itself, I think, is really interesting. There's a sort of division of labor implicit in this, in this automation project. Uh, but I'll talk a very little bit first about uh, the computer contribution to this side, which is, of course, the resolution principle, um, which was introduced uh, by this man, John Allen Robinson. He started spending his summers at Argonne in the early 1960s. Uh, he was actually a classicist who, who came over from the US from Oxford uh, to study philosophy at Princeton. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's also, just, there, some of these people are quite remarkable. Um, and he came to believe, as did many people, that computers and minds are just quantitatively but also qualitatively different. Uh, and in his work as a classicist, he, he became convinced that the entire history of logic, all the way back to the classics, was dependent on the sort of limitations of human psychology. Everything people committed to as, a, as an inference principle, as a basic premise, was, was structured around what human minds could do. And he thought computers offered us an opportunity to rethink what logic is, to rethink what reasoning is, and to sort of move forward in, in quite a different way. And I think it's worth I'm quoting him at some length because he's really interesting. <laughs> so he writes, traditionally, a single step in deduction has been required for pragmatic and psychological reasons to be simple enough, broadly speaking, to be apprehended as correct by a human being in a single intellectual act. Um, this is sort of going back to what Whitehead and Russell took so for granted about the naturalness of, of human psychology. Uh, when the agent carrying out the application of an inference principle is a modern machine, the traditional limitation on the complexity of inference principles is no longer very appropriate. Uh, more powerful principles involving perhaps a much greater amount of combinatorial information processing for a single application become a possibility. So he thought there's this way that logic has been dependent on human psychology for its entire history, but in fact there's nothing intrinsic about logic um, that makes it so. We have made it so, and here with the computer is an opportunity to imagine other logics and other rules. Uh, and in 1965, he introduced the resolution principle, which is among the most powerful of those rules. Um, and it's also a bit involved, but I'll describe it just at a very general level, and then sort of give an example. Um, resolution allows you to take two parent clauses and resolve them into a child clause. The parent clauses have to have a particular property, namely that one contains a complementary little literal of another. Um, so that means that one contains something that is the negation of one that appears in the other parent clause. Although, of course, all these variables here can themselves be replaced with propositions in a nested way. So this makes it look simpler than it is. Uh, and in this kind of structure, resolution, generally speaking, can resolve to a child clause that has no instance of that literal which was negated in the parent clauses. So that's simple enough to say um, resolution had built into it mechanisms where the computer would check whether a given pair of clauses could be transformed so as to have this property. Um, also, it could do it for more than two parent clauses. It was really a powerful rule. Uh, most of the work done in automated theorem proving these days uh, are, are based on the resolution principle variations thereof. It's become a really powerful tool, um, which is quite remarkable. In 2012, I heard Robinson speak at the at the um, conference, uh, the, the Joint Conference for Automated Reasoning, which is a 
parent organization to the Conference for Automated Deduction, which is a sort of American community. And he said, at that conference, he actually thinks uh, that this moment in 1965 with the resolution principle might have been a big mistake um, because it sort of took proof away from people. It black boxed it. Resolution proofs are, are deeply involved and hard to follow. Yeah. It was precisely this idea that <laughs> mathematicians didn't turn out to be so interested in this because it didn't give them anything to use. It just showed them that something was true. And, and so it was very remarkable to hear Robinson speak about this moment as, as a sort of here is maybe where automated theorem proving and mathematics parted ways in a way that troubled uh -huh. him and is very interesting. Yes? It seemed like if you go back to the, his, that quotation, yes. that's a logician writing, not a mathematician. Yes, that's right. That's true. And he, is, he, has never, he actually makes no claim to being a logician either. Um, he but, still... But when a mathematician talks about a step that is simple enough to be apprehended as correct in a single intellectual act, typically you can't. It's a huge amount of work to persuade the computer but that's true. Oh, of course. Yeah, that's so true. There's an enormous true. gap between this story and anything the mathematicians actually do. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's right. That's right. So on one end, there's this sort of myth from, from logic that we are persistent rule following, you know, applying inference rules. And then on the other end, there's what actual mathematicians do. And then in the middle are these automation attempts that are pulling from and, and making claims about both ends of that in really interesting ways. I think that's, I think that's right. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I think I think Robinson would agree as well that this is not a description of mathematical practice, but that it it's a it's a logical claim. But but resolution resolution provers today are often used to sort of process really large databases. Sometimes resolution provers collaborate with each other instead of with a person and do really astonishing things and they don't produce the kinds of insights or ideas that mathematicians can can take with them to the you know, to the paper and pencil practice that they are engaged in. Although th things are changing now. But it's not just the paper and principle practice. It's the inspiration for guessing. Yeah, you know, that's right. That, that's right. that you want that that a non a, a more conventional proof, a proof from the book, uh, yeah. is one which gives you an insight which allows you to guess another theorem. That's right. And the resolution proof does not in any way enhance your ability to guess. That's right. That's exactly As right. As compared to something like Mathematica, which is an engine for simulation, which is extremely useful to many of us. Well, yeah. So experimental mathematics helps you, and things like yeah. Mathematica help you to guess. Or seeing, you know, a proof from the book, a real proof like that's the right that's the real reason, yeah. uh, gives you inspiration, which allows you to guess. And a resolution proof gives you an answer and no insight on how to guess what the next correct Wait, theorem Wait, why can't I turn this around and say, I have an intuition that guess, and there's one step where I have the intuition that this follow from that. And I have no idea how to prove that step. And then no, no, I can no, use the no, and resolution, but the, but, the, but the point is for something totally new. When I take the insight and I say, oh, well, oh, might that weird <laughs> thing be true? Anyway, we shouldn't, we should, no, no, we no, should let Stephanie finish. Stephanie, take one Stephanie. minute to wrap up. Or she can put <laughs> us in a little <laughs> cage and study us. <laughs> sure. So I was going to, I was going to juxtapose resolution to the syllogism, of course. This is a sort of natural inference. This is the kind of inference resolution allows you to do, and, and you, can, you can work this out, but it's not immediately obvious. And so resolution asks you to admit this kind of step uh, to, to your work. Um, of course, the other half of this collaboration was what exactly is it that the humans contribute to this collaboration? And we know that's supposed to be intuitions, uh, but I like to finish with this because this was, in fact, the first thing I discovered in doing this research where I thought, well, that's really strange. Um, so the way that human users input their intuition to the computer, of course, in order to do that, intuition has to be translated into computer input in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, they devised something called the waiting mechanism in which the user could input waiting templates to tell the computer that certain kinds of information were more important than other kinds for certain kinds of problems. So mm -hmm. could say that the, the sum of two sums is more important than the, the product of two products, or that shorter clauses are preferable to larger clauses. Um, 
and, and the aura would preferentially produce clauses whose ancestral clauses had the highest concentration of this quantified weighted information given as these templates by the user. So I thought when I read this, do that? Was was so committed to this idea of intuition as something uniquely human and totally unautomatable, this eureka moment in the shower, but in actually building this interface into aura, intuition becomes this waiting mechanism. Uh, they couldn't help but translate it into the technical vocabulary of, of the machine they were working with. And, and I think this is a really interesting and surprising kind of tr transformation um, that, that took place there. I have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, graph. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask her afterwards. I'm going to have to like, pull to her talk, off talk with a cane. <laughs> So I'll skip these things and I'll just oh. say at the very end that uh, so far the history of software, as I said to some of you today that I had the pleasure of talking with, um, at least in sort of academic his history of computing circles, has really been treated at a very high level of generalization. Um, implementation, memory management problems, algorithm development, um, more work has been done on the construction of human-computer interfaces, but even that is often relegated to the screen and not under the hood. And, uh, so, so I, throughout my work, have tried to emphasize that implementation is a really significant epistemological factor for the history of computing and its relevance in academic disciplines like mathematics and that uh, more people should pay attention to those things when they write the history of, of software. So I'm trying to do that as my collaborator, Dan, in the back. We're yeah. going to write some history of software together. And well. in the last 1.5 minutes, will you just say what you're thinking about doing? Oh, sure. <laughs> Dan, do I have your permission to speak on our both our behalves? <laughs> so, so Dan and I are are writing, are working on in the very early stages of a history of Windows, um, and we are very interested in Windows because of its sort of place in the very complicated economy of hardware and software. We're interested in it uh, because. Um, it is a site where multiple pressures and constraints that you can't see when you study the history of one program are brought to bear on a very complicated problem. We're interested in the sort of dance of backwards compatibility and future proofing. Um, it won't be a history of Microsoft because we think Windows involves a lot of, of stakeholders, third party developers, hardware developers. Uh, Windows is sort of unique and exceptional in being a node where that kind of large scale software development <coughs> pressures are in the sort of crucible and we want to sort of bring this interest in implementation and design to bear on a, on a history that tracks those things. So um, maybe you'll be hearing more from us <laughs> about those things uh, hopefully soon. But thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure. So may I ask my yeah, question? Of <laughs> so, your, so your last paragraph reminded me a little bit how modern, oh, one first, yeah. so how modern chess programs work. So because oh. they sort of into deciding which moves to look at, uh, also use waiting reviews. Oh, so I didn't do you know, know whether they were influenced by this? Well, I do not know the answer to that. Um, I would be surprised if there wasn't some question. I know, so Ross Overbeek sort of developed and, and worked out the details of this waiting mechanism as his dissertation, and I know it was quite widely circulated among computing practitioners at this time, but I don't know how much it made its way out of we, We've kind of degenerated into a half questions. Why don't we just thank Stephanie again and get into the...